Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Today's guests share with us how they dealt with difficulties in their life and with God's help ultimately achieved their dreams. Former NFL football player and Dancing with the Stars winner Rashad Jennings and Christian artist Ryan Stevenson. Rashad Jennings is a former NFL football player who played with the Jacksonville Jaguars, the Oakland Raiders, and the New York Giants. He also appeared on Dancing with the Stars in 2017 and was the winner of that season. Rashad's life wasn't always defined by success, which he talks about in his new book entitled The If in Life. Against all odds, Rashad overcame several obstacles that might have halted his dream of becoming an NFL player. He shares about the challenges of his childhood, his sometimes difficult relationship with his father, and how eventually his family stood with each other in support, and ultimately to help Rashad reach his dreams. My name is Rashad Jennings. Um, I've been known in my time to be a NFL running back, which I was blessed to do for eight years. But surprisingly, I think a lot more people know me as Dancing with the Stars champ of season 24. And... Um, I'm proud to be now, soon here, an official author of a book titled The If in Life. And I grew up in Forest, Virginia, very small country town. I understood animals before I ever understood people. Still trying to figure out people, but I'm a small town kid. Um, I grew up an overweight, chubby kid with glasses, asthma, 0.6 GPA, with a uh, and with a desire and a dream to play in the NFL. I struggled in a major way academically. Um, again, going back to my point six. When I say point six, just to make sure, it's zero point six, as in F minus. So we're just clearing that up. Uh, for me, I had too many questions, which was a major issue for a kid to ask too many questions. They're legitimate questions, but I can see looking back in hindsight, how one, I was the class clown that never was trying to be funny. That was just me. Um, so when my hand went up to ask a genuine question, kids already like, hey, about to ask a question, watch this. I asked a question, ah, they die laughing, and I'm serious, the teacher thinks I'm playing, and it becomes an issue. Um, so that, that was a big part of what, why I was frustrated with school. But I was into, obviously, sports. I had two older brothers. They were 10 to 13 years older than me. I was the whoops. Here we go again, baby. Parents thought they couldn't have kids anymore. And God said, hey, here you go. Here's one for you. And um, so watching them play sports, I, I wanted to emulate them. But I was nowhere close to being athletic like they were. And so that was a battle, trying to carry that last name and be like my brothers. I had asthma growing up. I struggled. Um, one particular time I was hospitalized because of an asthma attack. I was sitting in the hospital blowing through a peak flow that the doctors gave me, and it only went a centimeter. At that time in my life, I was fighting for my next breath, regardless would I make it to accomplish any dream. Um, and when I was in the hospital for a week, hooked up to tubes, um, the doctors came in the room. My mom was in there, my dad was in there. And the doctors let my parents know how significant and severe my asthma was and told them that I cannot be around cigarette smoke. I have to get rid of my dog. We have to change a lot of things in the home, different air filters, and basically rehab the whole entire house conducive for me to live. When I came home from the doctors, we was in the house. A week later, my dad used to smoke and drink every day, all day long. And that was a part of what triggered my asthma. So when I got back home, the doctor said that he couldn't be smoking or in the house anymore. My dad started smoking outside. A week later, he started smoking inside again. I'm downstairs, I'm in my room. I could smell the smoke seeming through the vent. I started to choke up and I put a pillow over my face. I went upstairs, I knocked on my dad's door. He didn't answer, I opened it. He sat in the corner of his room in his chair, like he always does, smoking and drinking. I asked my dad, and this is the overweight chubby kid, glasses, red rim glasses, asthma, and the point six with a child's dream to go do something in his life. I looked at my dad, I said, dad, can you stop smoking and drinking to be there for me? 
took a puff of his smoke, blew it in the air, swig of his drink. He said, Rashad, what you want to do when you get older? Now, me and my dad don't have a great relationship and we never talk about anything. So part of me looked at this as an opportunity. Like my dad actually asked me what I want to do, even though he said it arrogant. I looked at him, I said, dad, I want to play running back in the NFL. And he took a puff of his smoke, swig of his drink. He said, do you think you'll be able to make it to the NFL without drinking or smoking yourself? What an attitude. Like, who are you to question me? And with tears in my eyes, I looked at him in the face and I said, Dad, just to prove you wrong, I'm never going to do it. And I'm 32, turning 33 here in a couple of days. I've never smoked a drink a day in my life. Um, and it was literally just to prove him wrong. And in doing that, and him watching his little knucklehead kid never drink, never smoke, and make it to the league, just like he said he was, just to prove him wrong, I watched my dad change his life. I watched him quit drinking and smoking and get more invested in the word. And so in a very strange way, me and my dad feel like we saved each other's life in that little moment. Um, and now we have a great relationship, but it's our unconditional love and there's a lot of stories about how we got to the place where we are today. So high school, my junior year, never played one snap of high school football up to this point. I was fifth string running back. Now we really didn't have a fifth string running back. They just kind of gave me that title. We only had four running backs. They was like, all right, we give him fifth. He'll feel better about himself. And I did. I was like, hey, I'm the fifth string running back because I wanted to play running back. I don't care. I could have been a seventh. I got a title. I'm a running back. So fifth string running back, never played, never played to the point where, where after we come out the uh, locker room, break the white tape, go on the sideline, I literally would take my helmet off, put it on the sideline, grab my Sprite, grab some uh, mini M&Ms and watch the show. That's what me and my buddy did. Um, Speedy, he was, he was terrible too, he didn't really play. He was bad. We would always just watch. And this particular game, we're playing against our high school rival, the Brookville Bees. If they win, they go to the playoffs. It's our last game regardless. So this is kind of like our Super Bowl. We're like, if we beat them, they won't make it to the playoffs. Last game of the season, we're going to leave it all on the line to make sure our rival team doesn't go. So um, it's packed, full house, and we got a, a Tennessee scout to watch our starting running back. And kick off, we get the ball. You know, first play, he gets hurt. And Speedy hits me. He's like, hey, man, you think you're going to get in today? And I'm like, nah, they ain't going to play me. Second string goes in. He gets hurt. And Speedy, hey, man, you think you're going to play? And I'm still like, mm, nah, they ain't going to put me in. Still eating my M&Ms. Third string goes in. He gets hurt. So they put in the fourth string running back. He goes out there. He gets hurt. So Speedy's like going nuts over here. He's like, hey, man, they go play you. And I'm like, I'm nervous now because I'm the fifth string running back. And part of me's like, yes, put me in. And part of me's like, no, I don't want to go in. So the coach is scanning the sidelines. He's looking, and I'm fifth. I'm next. He's scanning the sidelines. He catches eye contact exactly with me. He looks at somebody else, and he looks at a receiver. Puts the receiver in at running back instead of me. So part of me was like, Dad, gun it, I wanted to get in. The other part of me was like, I ain't got to go in. So he goes out, gets hurt. Coach flips off. Janice, get in the game. Finally get a chance to go in. So I'm like, I'm like in tunnel vision right now. I got Speedy over here shaking me. You about to go in the game. And I'm sitting here just like rocking from him shaking me. Like I'm about to go in. I started looking for my helmet. I can't find my helmet. So I pick up a random helmet, put it on. It's way too big. So the quarterback gives us the play and it's a run play. Now everybody gets in their respective uh, alliance and I'm in my stance back here playing running back. The quarterback's going through his cadence under the center. Blue 80. I'm screaming at him. I'm right behind him. I'm like, hey, what am I supposed to do? Blue 80. I'm like, hey. I said, hi. He turns around. I'm like, all right, here we go. Get the ball, make somebody miss, 40-yard touchdown. 
first play, first carry, 40-yard touchdown. So, you know, you can't tell me nothing. I'm amped. I throw the ball in the air somewhere crazy. I get a penalty. I don't care. Come back to the sideline. I run a chest bump speedy. He falls to the ground. I pick him back up. Like, it's, it's, I'm in my moment. And moving forward, they put in the uh, third string running back again. Eventually, they decided to give me another shot. Four or five plays later, I score another touchdown. The coaches don't know what to do. It's, I've never seen this many kids get hurt in one game. They decided to throw me in on defense because I always played, a scout, played scout team defense. Put me in, first play on defense. Said, hey, come off the edge, throw the tackle, make the running back miss, hit the quarterback, throw him on the ground, he fumbles. I pick it up, scoop and score. Third touchdown. And to finish the game is 20, we're, we're losing 24 to 21. They have the ball, it's fourth quarter, it's a minute left. They can run the clock out. For whatever reason, they ran the ball twice, and on the third down, they decided to throw it. I'm playing defense in, and they throw a screen. Somehow I sniff it out. Quarterback lobs it up, and I'm like, I can't believe he just threw that ball in the air. I pick it, score, finish the game, walk off, game over, score four touchdowns, and only, and only played 14 total plays. This was the first game my brothers actually attended too, because they both played college ball. They went on, they're 10 and 13 years older than me. They wanted to come back just to watch their younger brother play. Knowing that I wasn't gonna play, they just wanted to be there and like, hey, we love you, man. I know we all played college ball, we went to the pros, but it don't matter, we're here to show you we love you. And the Tennessee scout came to me after the game and he said, hey Rashad, I came to watch the starting running back, but I couldn't help but to notice you. How are your grades? I said, um, I have a point six. And he said something comical at the time. He, point six, how is that even possible? But he said, son, you have potential. Get your grades right. You could play at the collegiate level. For the very first time in my life, ever, outside of my family, the people that are gonna support me no matter what, Somebody saw potential in me, and that ignited something in me. Now, both of my brothers was at the game, and they saw something special in me, too. Both of my brothers decided to go to a private school, and they coached there for free to help pay half of tuition. My parents took a mortgage against the home to pay the other half of the tuition. I transferred to a private school. I repeated my junior year. I took nine homeschool classes on top of nine summer school classes, plus the academics of a regular school course. I stopped blaming people. I didn't make any excuses. I took ownership and responsibility. And from there, the rest was history. I got a fresh start, and it's nothing like a fresh start. I started off with a double major in psychology and sociology because I have a desire to be a marriage counselor. This is when I was at Pittsburgh University. Now I transferred to Liberty University after my first year. Why? My father ended up having to get his leg amputated. I wanted to transfer closer to home to be there for my mom to help her out around the house. Liberty University is 10 minutes from my home. So with no hesitation, I transferred. Now the dilemma was I was set to graduate in three years at Pitt with my double major. So the issue I had, because Liberty's a private school, none of my credits transferred. So I had to make a decision. Do I want to either stay eligible for football and change my major, or keep my major and set out of football? Well, it was an easy choice for me. I played football. <laughs> yeah, I switched my major. So I ended up uh, double majoring in sports management and business at Liberty with a minor in biblical education. It's funny how I got drafted because the seventh round draft pick comes up and I'm watching TV just like anybody else who watched the draft. I'm watching and Jacksonville Jaguars, seventh round pop up. They're talking about some players. The phone rings. Now my phone been ringing all day and it's my friends. Hey man, you get picked up. I'm like, leave me alone. Stop calling me. Click. Don't call me. My phone is clear for a team. So I get a call from an unknown number. 
Hello, hello, hello. And I see on the screen before I hear anything on the phone, Jacksonville Jaguars select Rashad Jennings. And I hear them on the phone. Now, everything starts to slow down. People yelling where I'm at, clapping, and I'm like, is this really happening? And I hear, hello, this is GM with Jacksonville Jaguars. Just Rashad Jennings. We have selected you in the seventh round. Are you excited to be a Jaguar? Before I could say anything, click Law Service. And I ain't gonna tell you what service provider I had at the time. <laughs> but you can imagine all this stuff we done went, I done went through and my family and everything. And are they gonna think I don't wanna play with them? Are they gonna like, does this mean I'm not gonna get drafted anymore? So eventually I calmed down. They called me back and we had the conversation. But uh, when I went to Jacksonville, it's a brand new beginning. Um, again, you have to go earn your right, you have to earn your respect. Um, and I was so excited. And I couldn't believe that I was inside an NFL locker room. And I'm looking at all the players that I watched growing up and I'm playing against them and I'm actually holding my own against them. And I'm like, oh, this doesn't even make sense. So it, it was such a neat experience as my rookie year. And I had to, it, it became, I think it's just like our faith. There's, there's levels into wherever we are in life, there's gonna be new type of challenges. High school challenges versus college challenges. Um, teenage versus adult. Single life versus married. Married then versus with kids. I think it's different type of challenges and chapters in our lives that we have um, to grow in. I was in the city one day. I was going to an autograph session in Manhattan. And as I'm walking through the city, I had on my headphones, I'm jamming. And it was at a time when Justin Bieber's new album just came out. It was great. Say what you want. Um, and the TMZ ran up to me, camera in my face. Hey, Rashad, where you going? Look like you're jamming, man. And I told him I'm going to autograph session. And I was. I was just like moving back and forth type of thing. I wasn't dancing. But he said, hey, man, looks like you got some nice moves. You know, he hyping it up. And I was like, you know, I can move a little bit. I'm just talking trash. And he says, yeah, man, you ever thought about doing Dancing with the Stars? Now, I've never watched the show at this point. So I just go with, I'm like, yeah, sounds great. I've never seen it. And uh, somehow, they got wind of that little clip. And so that started the initial conversation. Well, two years later, this thing became a reality. And Dancing with the Stars, the show was about removing your helmet. Don't nobody care about your stats. Don't nobody even care about the sport. You want to know who are you, period. And I got a chance to show America who I am, which was, was, was awesome just to even do that. It wasn't just a dance. It was like an expression of myself, of where I was at at that particular time. And the feedback was a couple things. One, um, especially the contemporary dance I did for my dad. Um, people at home when people wrote and people I would see in the streets, Steven now bring up that dance and that watched the show and said, Rashad, that dance you did for your father made me love differently. And nothing I ever done on football would make anybody love differently. The, the way I hit somebody is not gonna make anybody love differently. Me doing my little end zone celebration is never gonna make anybody say, you made me love differently. So that's huge to me. My faith has kept me grounded, for real, you know? And, and knowing God can give, God can take. Yeah, I mean, ain't nothing, again, there's nothing I'm doing that's, that's more creative or ambitious than anybody else. I check in with God constantly about doing for others. Um, I check in by, with God to make sure I'm doing everything I possibly can uh, to push forward the kingdom. Uh, I'm checking myself. Am I praying with people today? Did I reach out to a random person that I haven't talked to in a while? Um, I think about other people when I check in with God. I actually have a group chat with, with some buddies of mine, and it's, it's a video group chat. And we bring up topics of the day all the time, any and everything. And, you know, when we talk about God, that is our devotion. Like, we'll bring up something that we're going through. We'll bring up something that God's taken us through. We'll bring up something that we're struggling with or need accountability about. 
then we all look up scripture to help each other for that particular event or situation somebody finds them in. And that is like the accountability that you need. I feel like if you just bring God in the conversation, he'll do the rest. It's not rocket science. Um, but yes, finding a daily devotion, I believe is huge and pivotal um, because then it, 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 it forces you to look at life from a different perspective. So I will, if you don't mind me reading a daily devotion by Sarah Young. And this is uh, my birthday, March 26. Waiting on me means directing your attention to me in hopeful anticipation of what I will do. It entails trusting me with every fiber of your being instead of trying to figure everything out for yourself. Waiting on me is the way that I designed you to live all day and every day. I created you to stay conscious of me as you go about your daily, daily duties. I have promised many blessings to those who are waiting on me, a renewed strength, living above circumstances, a resurgent of hope, and an awareness of my continual presence. Waiting on me enables you to glorify me by living in deep dependence on me, ready to do my will. It also helps you enjoy me in the presence of fullness that I have in love and joy. Leviticus 3, 24 through 26, Isaiah 40, 31, and Psalms 16, 11, New King James Version. First thing it says, waiting on me. Waiting is an action of persistent. Um, when you're waiting on something, I, and I think it even says that if you're willing to look, it talks about um, directing your attention to me and hopeful anticipation. When you're anticipating, you're prepping for it. So you wait well. I'm, as I'm waiting for God to show up, I'm doing my part. And that kind of comes from the idea of I get on my knees and I pray to God as it all depends on him. I get off of my knees and I work as it all depends on me. That's what waiting looks like. That's what waiting looks like. <laughs> waiting is not sitting down, twiddling my thumbs and doing nothing. And um, I believe that that particular day that I was born reiterates that. I never forget me, that little kid. And I feel I owe him so much. Like, I keep a, I keep a picture with, of myself and my family, a, 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 a my family portrait, and then also just a picture of myself, that little kid. And I owe that dude so much. Like, I feel like I'm always hitting him on his chin, making him look up at me and say, hey, I got you. If you keep doing what you need to do, learning how to treat people, keep God in your life, and do what's right, it's gonna be okay. And sometimes you, you, you never forget where you come from, but you forget how you came from it. And writing his book reminded me, like I had to go back and, and show people my hometown and walk them through stories. And as I'm writing, I'm crying because I'm remembering being at this elementary. I'm remembering being in this particular seat. And I remember who was talking to me when they said what they said. And now it's becoming like a recap. And it was very vulnerable. And I appreciate it so much because it, 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 it's, it's, there's a work ethic too. And the book reminded me, it told me of this um, along the way. You know, I've been working my whole entire life to build a life with and for the people I love. But in doing that, I found myself always away from the people I want a life with and love. So, it also, writing this book reminded me, don't ever let the work get in the way 
as much as spending the time with the people you're working for. To find out more about Rashad's book, The If in Life, visit RashadJennings.com. We'll be right back after this brief message about a free offer from Jesus Calling. Want a daily reminder that we can have hope, peace, and joy each day in Jesus? Now it's as easy as opening an email. The Jesus Calling Daily Email brings you a thought from the Jesus Calling family of devotionals every day. Brighten up your inbox with this little reminder and take a minute to connect with God during your day. To sign up to get your free daily thought from Jesus Calling, please visit jesuscalling.com slash daily dash email. That's jesuscalling.com slash daily dash email. Our next guest is Grammy-nominated Christian music artist, Ryan Stevenson. After pursuing a career as a paramedic for seven years and doing music on the side, Pacific Northwest native Ryan Stevenson got the attention of Toby Mac by co-writing the number one and Grammy-nominated single, Speak Life. He was signed to Goatee Records and put his first recording out in 2013, which garnered the top 25 single, Holding Nothing Back. His 2015 full album, Fresh Start, featured the number one radio single, Eye of the Storm. Ryan is a rare talent whose unique perspective guides his honest lyrics and musical sensibilities. He shares with us today about his life, his pursuit of his dreams, and how God helped him through it all. My name is Ryan Stevenson. I am a Christian singer-songwriter in the CCM music industry and I am 39 years old, and I live here in Franklin, Tennessee. I am originally from Southern Oregon. I was born and raised in a little farming community uh, in Southern Oregon, about 10 miles from the California border. So born and raised on the West Coast my entire life. As a kid growing up in Southern Oregon was um, amazing. Uh, I grew up in a really small, tight-knit community that really focused on um, the value of hard work and loyalty and integrity and, and honoring your commitments, letting your yes your, be your yes and your no be your no. I just grew up with hardworking conservative country people who we were just truly there for one another. And so that just became the, uh, the fabric of who I grew to be. I grew up in a poor household. Uh, in a pretty low socioeconomic um, spot. As a kid growing up, I was very aware at a young age that we didn't have much, and I and I carried that, and it just kind of, uh, it really tampered with me emotionally a lot as a youngster. A lot of people don't know this about me, but um, when I was in the seventh grade, I stopped growing, and I I'm I've, I was a very late bloomer, so I really didn't hit my growth spurt until I was almost 19. So all through high school, I stayed the body physically of a seventh grader, and all my friends grew, and I didn't. And so it was it was really difficult, uh, still feeling like a little boy while all my best friends are grown and muscular and athletic and getting girlfriends and, and being desired by people. And I, uh, I just never was. And it, um, it really left kind of this big old hole uh, in my heart um, that I wanted to fill. And so when I went away into college, all of a sudden I grew. I grew eight inches in about eight months. My when I graduated from high school into college. So I did all my growing in college, which is kind of weird. Um, and I just kind of really went searching. I didn't walk away from the Lord, but I really tried to just ease that pain in my life. I, I wanted to do whatever I could to make sure that people knew me, that they desired me. I, I desperately wanted to, um, I wanted people to, to notice me and to love me. And because for so many years, I just felt like I was undesirable. And so, you know, kind of all through college, I just, I went on a pursuit of just filling voids. I originally went to college to become a doctor. I wanted to go into pre-med, but my freshman year of college, I 
got into some trouble, got put on academic probation, and almost got kicked out my first semester. So I just kind of didn't really study much of anything my entire freshman year. I was just doing my thing. And um, by the time it came, by the time my junior year in college came and it was time for me to declare my major, um, I was, I declared my major as pre-med biology, but I was so far behind. I hadn't been taking any anatomy, physiology, science, chemistry, any of that stuff. And so my academic advisor was like, Ryan, what have you been doing the last two years? You're not even close. Uh, so I wanted to get in and out of college in four years and say that I had a degree. So I went through the education program and I got my bachelor's in education. And I, out of college, I, for my first two years out of college, I taught, I was a teacher. My first year out of college, I taught kindergarten. And then my second year, I taught high school. And it was, it was, I loved teaching kindergarten. It was so fun. I pretty much taught with a guitar in my hands all day and just loved on these kids. And it was so cool seeing them learn to read and then, you know, just grow and develop these little guys. For years, you know, I had wanted to do music full time. And in fact, I played in a band in college and we had played together for years and we were really, really uh, starting to catch a lot of steam. And I thought for sure that was going to be it and that was going to be our ticket and we were going to be really successful. And our band just kind of disbanded. Our lead singer got a record deal and went and did a solo thing and the rest of us just kind of went away. And so for years, I just felt like I had missed it. I had missed my calling. I had missed my purpose. After I finished up my teaching career, um, my wife and I went, we moved over to Boise, Idaho, because that's where she is from. My wife was born and raised in Idaho. We moved over there to be a little closer to her family. As soon as we got there, I went back to school and went back into emergency medical services and I got my license in the state of Idaho as a paramedic. And here I am, you know, just working as a paramedic while I see all my friends living out their dreams. And I felt like I was just stuck in this mundane season of life. And, um, but I was still, you know, leading worship at church and playing little regional coffee shops and conferences and camps and, you know, love offering gigs all around the Pacific Northwest, around Oregon and Washington, Northern California. And I, I did that all through my paramedic career, like the first five, six years, and in hopes that maybe someday I could develop and cultivate a little music business in the hopes that someday maybe I could do that full time and I wouldn't have to be a paramedic anymore. I remember asking the Lord one day in particular, I was just so discouraged and, and I felt so hopeless and I was exhausted you know, because I'm going to work every day on working 24-hour shifts, having a front row seat to addiction and rape and suicide and murder and catastrophic car wrecks where bodies are all over the freeway and burns. And the, I mean, I could go on and on and on about what I saw and tasted and smelt and touched. And um, I was just getting really tired. And it was starting to really take a toll on me. And I just remember asking the Lord one day, Lord, I would love to help people with my music. I would love to be a full-time musician. That's my dream. I know that you've crafted that dream into me. I would love to do it. But if I'm, all I want to know is that I'm your son. I want to know that I'm right with you. And I don't want to push into any more environments that you don't want me in. So if, if I need to lay down, if I need to, unclench my prized possession and lay down my dream today. And if that means that it dies today, I'm fine. I'll be a paramedic the rest of my life if that's what you have for me. Because I just, I just want to have peace with you and just know that I'm right with you and that I'm your son and that you're leading, you're steering my ship. And it was literally probably two weeks later, I responded to a 911 call I was at work, responded, I got dispatched to a 911 call that came out as a lightning strike. 
and it was a, a young lady. She's in her late 30s, early 40s. Um, she was out hiking in the foothills up behind Boise with her two little boys and her mom. They were looking at some property up in the hills, and um, this kind of freak storm just came out of nowhere. It was a beautiful sunny day, I remember that. This freak storm comes out of nowhere. It starts raining really hard. They are running, trying to get back to their Suburban, and they hear this loud bang. And the way the mom told it, they all were kind of knocked over and kind of confused, and they realized that lightning had just struck, and it had struck Laura right in the top of the head and just, just killed her. I was the paramedic that responded to that call. So by the time we got there, you know, we were several minutes away. I felt like we were pretty well past our window to even really be effective in resuscitation, CPR. Um, and she just, she looked really bad. She was obviously not breathing, no pulse, dead upon my arrival. And I saw her kids and I just felt like, man, I know she's not gonna make it, but I, I just can't leave her here on the side of the hill in front of her family. Let's just put her in the ambulance and I'll work on her in the way to the hospital. So we put her in the back of the ambulance. Long story short, I end up reviving her in the back of the ambulance on the way to the hospital. And she, she made a full recovery, like total, complete miracle. She recovered um, completely mentally okay no deficits, um, and she was in rehab for months and months because of some neurologic stuff, but ab about a year later, um, and it was a big national story too, which was kind of crazy. She was on the Today Show with Matt Lauer. Matt Lauer was flying out to Idaho. She was all over local news. She was on Larry King. So it was kind of this crazy national story about this awesome survival story. Her and I met up a year later at a banquet that the county put on for kind of showcasing the biggest noteworthy calls from the year before. Biggest, coolest survival stories. And um, I was obviously like the number one call. And her and I met up and we just kind of had this cool kindred connection. The more we got to know each other, the more we talked, the more she just uh, kind of felt connected with me and I to her. When you intervene in somebody's life to that degree, I feel like you kind of have this, this really special kindred connection with them. And the more she got to know me and my family, I remember, and you know, I wanna say this as respectfully as I can in, in all uh, respect and love to her. We don't share the same faith or beliefs. She's, she doesn't believe in Jesus. She doesn't want anything to do with the church. She is, uh, she just doesn't want any of it, but she just loves me. And here this lady is who doesn't share my faith, doesn't agree with my lifestyle and going to church and, and being a follower of Jesus, but she just sees something in me and says, I, I, I just see something in you, Ryan, something that's, not the paramedic. Like, if you weren't doing, what's your dream? What do you want to do? If, if you weren't doing this paramedic thing, what's your ultimate dream? And I said, well, that's easy. I would love to do music full time. And she's like, okay, well, how do you do that? What does that look like? I said, well, I need to record my songs. I've been writing songs for 10 years and I have this arsenal of songs. Uh, and I, I feel like I have five though that are really special and that I could make a demo and send to maybe a record company. But I really need to record them in the right way. I can't just go into my bedroom anymore and record it on a phone or an ADAT or whatever it was. At that time, I have to make a good recording. And so she's like, okay, well, basically what's, what's keeping you from doing that? I said, well, money, you know? I mean, I'm working as a paramedic. I'm making hardly anything and I don't have, you know, thousands of dollars sitting around to go record a demo. And so long story short, she wrote me a, she wrote me a $4,000 check and I went into this studio and recorded 
of my little five song EP, sent that to a record company, and that got me my first record deal. And it was like a crazy transition of literally working on the streets as a paramedic to when this thing happened, I was in the ambulance and I would hear my songs on the radio and then it really kind of just picked up after that. My first song that I ever heard on the radio was on Air One Radio and it was my first single that we released on that record deal. It was called Yesterday, Today, Forever. Yes. It's been um, 14 years of just plowing and grinding and uh, staying hopeful in seasons of absolute gut-wrenching hopelessness and despair. I can definitely look back and see this beautiful tapestry, this meticulous crafting and, and orchestrating of my circumstances moment by moment that led me to literally right now. Sometimes the Lord, the Lord, when he has a plan for your life, which I believe he does, when he has a journey for your life, he will take his time setting that up. He will take his time cultivating the soil because he's a gardener, he's a planter. He'll plant a seed and then he'll water it for a long time and he'll just take his time really refining and purifying and stretching us and, and getting us to this place where I feel like he can ultimately really trust us with the assignment. Um, I feel like I'm a walking testimony of that. I got a lot of inspiration from reading Romans where, you know, Paul talks about nothing can separate us from his love. And I, nor height or depth, nor angels or demons, nor things present or things to come, nor powers, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us. And that's just such a, a message that I feel like really needs to be heard and owned in the church, especially these days, is that Jesus, he loves us. He, he bought and paid for us with the price. And I, and I just have a hard time believing that the devil can repossess something that Jesus paid for. And that's what I want to tell people. You're a daughter, you're a son, no matter what. It just awakened my heart to um, his grace. And, and I, I love it. You know, it, it kind of, it reminds me, there's elements of Jesus calling that, that kind of remind me of one of my favorite books called The Shack. And just how there's so many, uh, the way Jesus talks to the characters in that book, I feel like, Jesus Calling talks to me as I'm one of those characters. Like, just speaking peace and assurance and rest and hope over me. I first became aware of, of Jesus Calling a few years back. Um, somebody gave me a copy uh, from my church. And I think I got one as a in, in a gift bag when I went and played at a church. And I had never even heard of it. And then when I um, started reading it, you know, in the morning, it was just so different. It was so vastly different from anything that I had read. I can definitely say it was like this whole new perspective of just compassion and grace and sensitivity and just heart that I felt like if Jesus was going to come into the room and sit here with me, this is what I think he would say. These are the things that I would think he would speak over me. I would say that this is a favorite of mine. Um, December 1st. I love you with an everlasting love, which flows out from the depths of eternity. Before you were born, I knew you. Ponder the awesome mystery of a love that encompasses you from before birth to beyond the grave. Modern man has lost the perspective of eternity. To distract himself from the gaping jaws of death, he engages in ceaseless activity and amusement. The practice of being still in my presence is almost a lost art. Yet, 
It is this very stillness that enables you to experience my eternal love. I love that line. You need the certainty of my loving presence in order to weather the storms of life. During times of severe testing, even the best theology can fail you if it isn't accompanied by experiential knowledge of me. The ultimate protection against sinking during life's storms is devoting time to develop your friendship with me. I love that last line. The ultimate protection against sinking during life storms is devoting time to me. My song, Eye of the Storm, I really hope that people just find hope and comfort in knowing that Jesus is here and that he's with us. You know, working on the streets as a paramedic for nine years, it's easy to tap into pain and uncertainty. And, you know, I, I got a front row seat to, for years to people truly in the midst of deep loss and great sadness and lives being torn apart. And it woke me up. It changed my life. It gave me an incredible sensitivity for life. It shifted my entire perspective on things that are important in life, things that I value, that I place value on. Um, it changed me. I'm gonna talk about things that matter, things that are important, things that are raw, things that actually talk about what people are actually dealing with. Human beings out here in these neighborhoods that look affluent, that look normal, that look like everything's all together, but inside those homes, they're in shambles and there's rampant addiction and there's domestic abuse and violence. I wanna to talk to that stuff because it's real and it's all of us. Eye of the Storm was written and the rest of this I've had very little to do with. I just wrote the song. I've prayed through these songs like you wouldn't believe. You know, kind of what we were just talking about uh, in Jesus Calling, beating the distractions and, and spending time with the Lord, being absolutely devoted to Him. My song, no matter what, my, the whole message and theme behind it and behind the entire record really is beloved identity. And that's just a theme that I felt like the Lord has whispered to me for the last two years. Like, you are my son. You're my son. I, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how you feel about yourself. It doesn't matter how you see yourself, what you think about yourself. I love you with an everlasting love. And I would love to encourage people, just don't discredit the seasons of your life, the chapters of your life that you feel are mundane that you feel you're like you're going nowhere, that nothing makes any sense, that you don't matter, that you've been forgotten about, that you've been overlooked. It's really those moments of just day to day, day in, day out life where nobody's watching and nobody's paying attention, where he is cultivating the soil of your heart and really using the those moments to shift you into the mainstream of the purposes that he has for you. So don't be discouraged or discount the years even of walking with him. Because just like David hung out in a field for years, that that may be what he's he's doing right now in your life. He's never been closer, I can promise you that. To find out more about Ryan Stevenson's music and his latest record, No Matter What, please visit ryanstevensonmusic.com. Do you love hearing great stories of faith each week via the Jesus Calling podcast? We want to hear from you. If you haven't already subscribed to the Jesus Calling podcast, visit the Jesus Calling page at itunes.com and hit the subscribe button. While you're there, we'd love for you to leave us a review and tell us how you feel about the show and what future guests you'd love to see. Your reviews and subscription help us share these stories of faith to more people who need the hope and encouragement of Jesus Calling. If you have your own story to share, we'd love to hear from you. Visit JesusCalling.com to share your story today.